I am Dr. Tansir Askar. I am a laparoscopic general and bariatric surgeon working in Pakistan. Uh, I am also managing director of GLR. So today we will be uh, delivering a small lecture, an interactive one about the trocars and the laparoscopic instruments. So first of all, there are two types of uh, trocars which are used in laparoscopy. They are reusable trocars and the disposable trocars. They have different sizes. First of all, I will give you detail about the uh, reusable trocars. They are usually metallic trocars. Um, and basically uh, saying them trocar is a misnomer. This is trocar, the, the steelhead which goes inside. And this is the cannula. So when you put the trocar in the cannula, it mix, makes port. And why is it called port? Because it is a pathway to go in and outside the abdomen in laparoscopy. So coming on to the trocar first, the trocars are of different types, both in disposable and reusable um, uh, trocars. This is called the safety trocar. You can see there is a safety wall over it and a sharp edge inside it. When uh, you go in by putting it inside the port by clockwise and anti-clockwise motion, and you enter into the abdomen through this sharp end. And once you enter into the abdomen, it comes out. So it saves the viscera's from getting damaged. So it is called the safety trocar. There are other types of trocar as well, like uh, this one. This has an end which is called pyramid end. It looks like a pyramid. The superiority of this trocar is that when you go in, Cutting in the abdominal wall, it gives more space and it splits the muscles well. Then there is another type of trocar, which usually is available in the disposable ports. It is called OptiPort or Optical Port. Because when you put the camera telescope inside it, you can visualize it on the screen. Everything, every layer you can visualize. Mm -hmm. So this is all about trocars. Now coming on to the cannula. The cannula has, has different components and different companies promoted in different manner. You can see small holes over here. When you go in, the, uh, basically uh, the carbon dioxide gas, which is used for encephalation, goes in. And there is another hole over the trocar and you, hit, you hear a hissing sound that you are inside the abdominal cavity, right? When you are putting the second or third trocar. So it has a shaft and there is a wall over here through which you can attach the gas through the pipe, right? And you can switch it and switch off from here. Then you can, if you open this trocar, you can see a safety valve over here as well. This is a valve which should be working well. So it, when uh, you start the procedure, it doesn't leaks, okay? Like this. Then there is a plastic type of uh, sleeve over here, which you which should be very good. It should not be cut. It should not be torn because if there is um, uh, low pressure in the abdomen, it will be very difficult to operate. Can, come to me after you have can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. It's Dr. Sir, excellent. Thank here. you very much. So coming on to another disposable trocar, this is a five millimeter trocar. The mechanism is same. It has also got a safety valve a shaft, it can be opened as well, a valve inside, flap type valve, right? And it has got a valve here to control the gas pressure. There are also three mm trocars and they are smaller in length and they are usually used in the pediatric surgery. Usual length of this trocar is 15 centimeters, but there are long length trocars as well, which we use in the bariatric procedures and in the super obese patients and other laparoscopic policies like to an trocar, which is 
a bladeless choker and it is 11 mm and some companies make it 10 mm okay it has also got a uh, cannula which i told you that it is a pyramid shape cannula it has also got a shaft and you can see the ridges over it right here this is a very good trocar but when you go in and rotate it clockwise and anti-clockwise and you go in it doesn't allow uh, very easily to come uh, to a car to come out when you are taking out the camera or taking out the instruments. On the other hand, if you use this stroke car, which doesn't have these ridges, it can come out with the uh, uh, pull of the instrument. So you have to be careful and you have to, uh, you know, be static or hold this uh, stroke car otherwise. So this stroke car also has a, uh, a shaft and there is a valve as well to control the gas which is attached over here. And there is there are different types of uh, mechanisms in this um, cannula. There's a mechanism of pushing down the button and rotating it to open it up. And here you can see a valve. Again, a valve is here, <clears throat> which stops the carbon dioxide to uh, goes out, uh, come out from here. And here you can see an other safety valve from which you can go in. Okay. Coming on to another trocar, this is a same disposable trocar. The superiority of this trocar is that it is an it is a optical trocar, optiport. So you can put the camera in, the telescope in, and you can see the uh, muscles and different layers of the abdomen being cut. The rest of the mechanism is exactly the same. So in the disposable ones, there are also cars which are five millimeter and they have almost the same mechanism and it is a pyramidal shape trocar tip the ports cannula is uh, having ridges and it is five mm in diameter and about 13 to 15 centimeters in length in different uh, companies make different lengths <clears throat> there is a valve as well and you can see the entry point as well so if you are using a reusable tow car. The thing is that you can put a 10 mm instrument inside like this. You're putting a 10 millimeter instrument inside. But if you have to put a five millimeter, any instrument of five millimeter, and if you go inside it, it would leak, right? So you have to have something which helps you to use the five millimeter instrument because as you as we all know that the usual instruments in laparoscopy are five millimeter instruments especially in the basic laparoscopy so this is called the reducer or sleeve you put it in like this put a finger over it so it doesn't leak and you can very easily put the five mm instrument inside like this Okay, so this is a journal brief description about the ports. So I am repeating that they're the most commonly used instruments in the basic laparoscopy are 10 or 11 mm ports uh, and 5 mm ports in general surgery and in most of the gynecological and urological surgeries. And the other trocar which are being used in uh, ports and the uh, mm ports are also used uh, in the pediatric surgery patients. So th th there are a few more instruments which are related to this. This is the Veriz needle. This is a special type of needle which gives you an access to the uh, abdominal cavity. So when you will be studying access, it will be uh, told in uh, more detail. Um, for now, it has got a blunt end. When you go in, it automatically uh, saves the, you know, it has a sharp end. If you can see, when it, you go in, this blunt end will come out. And you will attach a gas or its pipe over it, right? So this is an important instrument. Now coming on to the other laparoscopic instruments which we usually use in the basic laparoscopy. So as we 
most of us know, because all of us are surgeons, uh, that this is an important instrument. What is this instrument called? It is called endodissect. This is an endodissector. You can see the tip of it. It is just like an artery forcep angulated in front. It is also called Maryland, right? It has got a shaft handle. And here you there is a um, revolving, reticulating uh, type of thing from which we can rotate it, right? This is a knob for the rotation. Here you can see an, a thing which is metallic and you can attach the cautery over it like this. So can you, you can use it during surgery if you require any coagulation. The other important instruments are endograspers. So the endograspers are of different types. Uh, they can be atraumatic endograspers like Babcock's. They can be traumatic endograspers to have a big uh, bite and a uh, strong grip, uh, grip. They can be single action endograspers like Johans. They can be double action endograspers. And there are some other specialized type of uh, endograspers. I'll give you a brief account upon the endograspers with locks and without locks. In this uh, laparoscopic instruments, also there are reusable instruments which you can sterilize and they can be at the same time disposable instruments which you can use in, in, in a case and you can just throw them away. So here you can see this is a grasper which is a double action grasper and it is an atraumatic grasper, right? And it is having no lock over it. There is no lock. Okay. And I'll show you the lock or the ratchet, what it is meant and what is for what, uh, for what it is used. So you can easily, uh, you know, hold the bowel during the appendicectomy uh, or any other procedure in abdominal during laparoscopy. It has also got um, the area to be attached with the cautery and there is a handle and a knob to rotate it. Now I will show you a disposable trocar with a lock. Here you can see there is a lock. It, uh, it is a grasper which has got ridges and it, it will be able to hold the uh, viscera well. Like in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, sometimes you need a uh, uh, sometimes you need a grasper. Uh, if the, if the, it is so inflamed or there is empyema that it should hold it well. And it has a lock as well. And if it is locked, you, you can see it cannot be open until and unless you unlock it, right? This is an other grasper without a lock and you can see it is called a Babcock. It has exactly the same um, shape as the open Babcock has. You can see it is a double action one. It is also used to usually uh, grasp the bowel. It has also a rotating uh, knob and you can also apply a cautery over here if required. So this is an other uh, grasper uh, with a very sharp edge to hold instruments, uh, to hold uh, viscerals or take some small biopsies, right? Tightly. It is also without lock. This is an other instrument with lock having double action, right? Okay, this is an endo -seizer. You can see the shape of the Caesar. The Caesar also have different shapes at the tip. Some are curved, some are straight, right? This is a reusable instrument. This is a disposable instrument. Both have rotating heads, right? and both have cautery places to be attached. Basically, it is used for cutting the, uh, for example, the cystic duct or any other uh, viscera like the base of the appendix or it can be used in the bowel as well. Now, this is an other important uh, instrument which is called L-hook. Okay, you see there is a tip L type tip over it. You can use it for cautery 
part three and it has an end over here where you can attach the lead for of the cord tree. You, you, you have used, must have used this in the laparoscopic polycystectomy and it can be used in almost all the um, surgery, laparoscopic surgeries. Okay. This is an other important instrument. Okay, it's, it is a extractor. It is 10 mm instrument. Usually we, we have seen it using, uh, extracting the gallbladder, right? It has also a rotating shaft and a knob to rotate it, and it can be locked as well. Sometimes some companies make it, makes it which is not of lock, but most of the people use it locked ones. And it is usually called crocodile. You know, it opens its mouth like a crocodile. See? Okay. Now, this is another important instrument which is usually used in advanced laparoscopy because in basic laparoscopy, you, don't, you are not so good at uh, the intracorporeal sushing and knotting. This is uh, a needle holder, endo needle holder. You can see it is, they are of different types, right? This is the shaft. This is the lock. And you can unlock it by pressing it like this. So you mount a needle over it and start sushing. There are some companies which are making the autocorrect type of um, needle holders in which you just hold the needle, it will autocorrect and will be in a straight line. Okay, now this is a grasper, uh, punch biopsy forceps. Laparoscopically, if you want to have a biopsy, you can just hold it and pull it, right? Here you can see an other instrument, which is aspiration needle. Uh, when you have a very tense uh, gallbladder like empyema or it has thick walls and fully filled or the stone is impacted at the uh, neck of the gallbladder, you usually put this aspiration needle in with much safety and then you attach it to the suction and you suck it out the bile or the uh, pus inside the empyema gallbladder. Okay. This is another instrument just like uh, L-hook, but it is called spatula. It has got a flatter end like you see, and you can attach this to the cautery. So it is used in the liver bed or at places where you want to have a cautery with a blunt end. This is a very important instrument. This is called the no. Not pusher, right? You see, there is a hole inside it. Usually the extra corporeal knots, which are tied and put inside, for example, if you are tying the base of the um, appendix, right? You uh, put in the, um, that uh, basically extra corporeal knot and pass it through it. And then you, when you will push it, the knot will go in. So it is, the knot pusher. So this is a brief description of some of the important instruments we are using in laparoscopy. Then there, basic laparoscopy. Then there are a few things which I want to tell you. This is a telescope, which which is a zero degree telescope and ten mm in diameter. There is, a, uh, I will tell you in more detail in when I'll be telling you about the lab stack. This is a thirty degree telescope and 10 millimeters. And this is a five degree telescope, uh, five mm telescope with zero degree, right? So these are some more important instruments usually used in uh, advanced laparoscopy, but these days they are used in um, basic laparoscopy as well. For example, this is a Ligashore. Ligashore is an advanced bipolar uh, technology uh, gadget which we use uh, ligating the vessels and cutting them. So it has got a shaft. It is attached to the Liga Shore base unit. And this has got a shaft. And it, the length of this shaft is 37 centimeters and diameter is 5 mm. But we can also have this Liga Shore in 10 mm and 37 centimeters. And it has got a Maryland tip, endodisect tip. This is the speciality of this one, but it has also got a dolphin tip as well. 
from here we can rotate it this is the rotating knob from when we press it like this it starts coagulation at the tip and there is a special sound when it comes the cycle is complete we leave it and we cut it from this cutting knob so this is uh, liga shore and you will learn it more in the energy devices so this is also important instruments disposable this is a tacker which is used in the uh, hernias right this is an other tacker which use is also used in usually ventral hernia this is an absorbable tacker the previous one was a metallic um, uh, tacker okay so you can have a roticulating type of maneuverability with it up to almost 120 degrees because um, it is difficult in the ventral hernias to tack with the interior abdominal wall so here you can see with the abdominal wall the uh, it will be less difficulty when it can be rotated like this so this is this is here you can see a clip applicator which we usually use uh, to clipping while clipping the um, lega clips at the cystic duct or cystic artery you can see it it has got a here you can put the lega clips in okay and you just push it and the lega clip is closed it, this is a shaft of the um, uh, you can see the shaft of the instrument and this is the knob where you can rotate it here this is the handle for pressing it okay and other important instrument is a very important instrument rather is the suction and irrigation so it has got a shaft this is a 5 mm suction irrigation system it has got a shaft it has got a handle and th there is a knob which if you go up it will do suction and if you go down it will do irrigation and you can attach two uh janker suctions or pipes over here one will be attached to the suction and the other one will be attached to the irrigation and if during uh, you know suction we know that if the some stones or something gets stuck there is a knob which you can unlock and you can just wash it from here right and you should be knowing it by yourself more than the technician On, only then being surgeon you can you know instruct people what to do okay so this is another knob if it doesn't get settled it get just gets open from here and you can take this thing out and you can wash it as well so it was a brief description about the ports and about uh, the uh, ports and the uh, basic laparoscopic instruments the basic laparoscopic instruments usually are 35 to 37 cm in length and in bariatrics and or the in the obese patients we use instruments which are around 43 to 45 cm in length and the mostly used instruments are 5 or 10 mm but in pediatric surgery 3 mm instruments are also used so if there is any question regarding the instruments or the graspers or anything you can please ask can you hear me thanks tanseer that's great uh, i think the best thing is if you want to do the next one on the stack and then yeah. we can open questions for both of them together should okay. we do that right right yes sir we should do that first of all we'll do the patient positioning then we'll go for the lap stack dr tanseer excellent yeah excellent and uh, uh -huh. in detail in detail this was a presentation and excellent presentation especially instruments and you have talked in detail excellent thank you very much and i so, think i think i like your style this time of doing it uh, virtually with with everything in front of you yeah, yeah yeah sir uh, actually uh, i would have made a powerpoint presentation but uh, i thought it better to uh, show the instruments live and discuss it uh, and make it a bit of uh, interactive one so that people can see the instruments and we can talk in detail at the end of this lecture so um, now we will be going towards the Uh, uh, patient positioning in laparoscopic surgery. That uh, positioning usually has all the same terminologies like the um, like in the open surgery. So the best position and the most commonly used position in 
uh, laparoscopy is supine position. The most important thing is that uh, when you uh, are considering the supine position, you should wait to put the arms and what to do. So there are two ways of putting the arms. I will demonstrate it on the um, patient as well. But if you will put arms like this and they are above 90 degrees and the procedure is like long enough, one and one and a half hour, it will cause brachial plexus injury. So you have to be very careful. So either you will place the arms up to 90 degree or less than 90 degree during the procedure. And it is better to tuck in that arm at least, which is towards the side of the surgeon. And if possible, tuck in the both arms. I'll show you how to tuck in the both arms. It will give you more space on both sides and your assistant and the all team will be very easy to perform that procedure. So first of all, we thanks the, uh, our colleague who has um, volunteered to be a patient. So uh, now this is uh, basically a supine position. And as you can see, you can give a panoramic view. Uh, you can go back and give a panoramic view. So this is a supine position. Patient is lying flat on the bed. His arms are, you know, wide apart on the armrest and they are almost at 90 degrees. Okay. So this pillow has been put to give comfort to the patient. Different anesthetists and this different uh, doctors do differently. They, they put a uh, head ring uh, beneath the uh, head as well. Okay, so uh, the other side uh, way is to put the arm inside and tuck in the arm. And we can do it on one side and we can do on both sides. So in this way, you get better position and more space for the surgeon and for the assistant to assist. Okay. So this is a belt which is used for the safety of the patient. It is usually tied at the level of the pelvis, interspay alex spine area, but you can also tie it just two inch below the knees. And you can tie it in at both ends in different procedures. Here you can see the padded foot support. This, you can show it from here, the padded foot support. This is very important if you are doing a reverse Strandenberg procedure, like in bariatric surgery, this would be of great need. Okay, so what we do is we lie the patient tell you the uh, position is called the trendinger burst procedure here you can see go up, give a panoramic view go back and you can see you can that's it you can tilt the patient to 15 to 30 degrees 35 degrees in this uh, in this procedure uh, in this position trendinger position and this position if i give an example is usually used in laparoscopic appendicectomy or laparoscopic gynecological procedures where you work in the pelvis more, so you want the vistas to go back. So uh, if we want to do a laparoscopic appendectomy, we give a right up as well, right up. Right up, please. This is right up. Okay, that's it. So now, straight the patient. Lock the bell Okay, we are flattening the table. The other position we are going to narrate is the reverse trend and reverse position head up. So this procedure, uh, this position is usually used in laparoscopic polycystectomy, laparoscopic bariatric procedures. And you can do a write up as well, write up, which is usually used head up and write up is usually used in laparoscopic polycystectomy procedures. Okay, then you can again flatten the bed. So there is an other procedure uh, position which we usually use. 
which is called the letter position, which we use in uh, nephrectomies and the fifth order wrecking So in this procedure, we make the patient in a slide and make him comfortable by putting the like this, and we apply the belt again for safety. Like this. Okay, now you can break the table for some time. Break the table. So in this procedure, uh, come over here. We are breaking the table in between so that the kidneys become more prominent. That's it. Okay, you can just straighten up the uh, patient. Okay, thank you. Just turn around. So another important position is called the French position. So there are two types of surgeons. Some surgeons want to do the surgery standing on the right or left of the patient. And then there are surgeons who want to perform surgery by standing between the legs. And if the uh, surgeon is standing between the legs, this is called French position. Some surgeons do even polycystectomy in this position, but the, most of the bariatric surgeons, uh, they use this French position to do the laparoscopy. Okay. In this, this foot is very, uh, padded foot uh, support is very important. Apply the uh, belts. Dr. Tansi, really excellent. Excellent. And just we can imagine we are with you in your operation room. And you. also, this is appreciable. So, your operation room is fully equipped. Yeah. This we is one of the best hospitals. Hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the best hospitals, no doubt. And so, it is so, the head end is up. This is the reverse standard bed position. And you can see that we can uh, fix this, these legs and tie these legs over here to give more comfort to the patient. And we usually do it in the bariatric procedures and we perform the surgery standing right here. Between the legs, especially. Okay. I'll do it. Okay. Now, there are some guys, uh, head office, can you, reverse standard bird. So we are now doing the reverse standard bird procedure uh, position. And in gynecological procedures, and if we are performing uh, interior resection or APR, so we have to make a lithotomy position as well during in laparoscopy as well. Lap assisted or total laparoscopic um, procedures uh, attach the poles. So we will quickly attach the poles. Okay. So we are making a lithotomy position while performing laparoscopy.
Okay, if you are uh, doing right hemi left hemiplectomy, or if you are performing APR laparoscopically, you stand at the right end of the patient. Okay, and you have to make a lithotomy position in some cases. And if you are performing a laparoscopic hysterectomy, usually you stand on the left side of the patient, and you have to have a, a, with a manipulator, vaginal manipulator, uterine manipulator put in through the uh, vagina and you have to make a, a lithotomy position. So here we will put the patient in the lithotomy position and we perform the laparoscopy here and we will detach these, um, uh, uh, these parts of the table and we can do a lithotomy position. So we will be free, it's okay. It's okay, just, just arise there. You can put them back and you can go up. Okay. Remove these lithotomy poles. Now I will uh, quickly give you an account of where to stand, where will the surgeon stand during these procedures. So these were the different table positions and in the lithotomy position, you have to have a bit of trendular bird position that means 15 to 35 degrees head down. Okay, in the laparoscopic polycystectomy, the surgeon usually stands on the left side and the laparoscope is in front of the surgeon usually. Um, and the assistant, uh, the cameraman stands on the left of the surgeon and the assistant stand, one assistant stands in the front of the surgeon as cab nurse on the opposite side of the surgeon. While you are performing laparoscopic appendicectomy, usually the surgeon stands on the left of the patient, um, you put in the ports and the cameraman st stands on the right of the surgeon holding the camera and one assistant or the scrub nurse stands on the opposite side of the uh, patient. Right. And uh, if you are performing a laparoscopic hysterectomy or ovarian cystectomy, uh, the surgeon stands on the left side of the patient and put the port in. The uh, cameraman stands on the right of the uh, surgeon and the assistant stands on the left, right side of the patient. So these are a few um, important procedures which you perform every day. So you should be knowing it. The, another important procedure is laparoscopic inguinal hernia. In the inguinal hernia, if you are performing the right inguinal hernia, the patient, the um, surgeon should stand on the left side of the patient and you, you put the <coughs> three ports in and the, your assistant will be on your right side, which will be holding the camera. The second assistant will be on the right of the patient. And if you are performing a left uh, hernia pair, laparoscopically, then you have to do on the right side of the patient to perform it on the left side. Then the cameraman will be holding the camera on your left side and the other person will be, uh, assistant will be on the left of the patient. So I am giving you a brief account of different positions in the routine procedures which we are performing. So in the advanced procedures, there are different things. For example, the bariatric, you are standing in, the, in between the legs, the cameraman on the right, the person who is detecting the liver on the right of the patient, and your first assist, uh, assistant will be on the left of the patient. This is how it goes. And same in the case with the uh, colorectal cases and upper GI cases, different techniques. So this is a brief account of, of the patient positioning, and we can discuss it at the end of the uh, discussion, uh, a few question answers. So now I will be describing the lap stack. So this is a lap tower on a lap stack. Here you can see this is a screen or the monitor. Here you can see the so insufflator. This is light source and this is the camera CCU or the camera unit. So there are different components. One is called the imaging component, which includes the monitor, the light source, and the CCU. And the other one is the insufflator and the carbon dioxide cylinder, which we can see here. So what we do is we, we have got uh, this system, which is called the insufflator on the top always. Initially, when we started laparoscopy, we used to think that camera should be at top. But why this should be a top? Because when you are operating, you always ask, what is the gas pressure? If it is at top, you can see yourself. But if it is down there, you have to, you know, 
hang up and see what is going on there. So this is uh, the uh, basically the uh, encephalator, which puts in the carbon dioxide into the patient. <clears throat> First, we will discuss about the imaging system. Imaging system consists of a um, monitor, and we attach our camera head. This is the camera head. Here you can see. <clears throat> this is the camera head. Can you give me the telescope, please? 10 degree, 10 mm telescope. This is a 10 millimeter telescope with a zero degree angle. Here we attach the telescope and we attach the light source exactly over here. And we attach the other end of the light source with a knob over here. Here you can see the shaft of the telescope. Here is the place to attach the telescope, uh, the camera, um, the light source. And here the telescope is attached with this knob. In this telescope, there are different components. Here you can see, here, right here, that you can zoom in and zoom out with this knob. This is for fine tuning of the image, right? So if you can see here in my hand, you can see that I can do a Good fine tuning if you can show them in, on the monitor, right? Like this, okay? So before you start with your procedures, you should first of all do a white balance. Here, if you can get, show them the buttons over here, over here. So you press this button once, okay? And then with this button upside and downside to show the monitor, you press it to the white balance and you just push it once and there is written white balance is okay, right? So you, you may proceed doing your procedure. Okay, hold it like this. This is basically a knob which you push in to start with the scope, okay? Now we will come to the encephalator. In insufflator, this is a switch on and switch off button. Okay, here you can see a start button and this is a stop button. So if you are going to start it, you just press it and it will get started. And you can hear a hissing voice. Give me the uh, this pipe. Uh, this is a connecting pipe where you, which you attach over here like this and the other end to the trocar once it is inside the abdomen, like this. First, you do an anticlockwise and then a clockwise maneuver, and it will get fed. And you open this, and you can hear a hissing voice. If there is any obstruction like this, the pressure will go up over here, okay? And it will give you a alarm as well. Here you see the pressure is going up and it, it's giving an alarm. It means there's some obstruction or the valve is off. So you will check it. The usual pressure we keep in the abdomen is 14 or 15 millimeters of mercury and which should be less than 19 to 20 millimeters of mercury. Okay. And I'm stopping it. Here you can see the flow rate. You can start with a low rate, then you can shift it to the medium and then to high rate, okay? And you set the flow rate up to 14 or 15 or 16. And this is the area which will show you how many, what is the flow rate in liters per minute? How many liters per minute is going inside the abdominal cavity? And what is the volume which it can be shown here, right? And I have told you if the tube is obstructed or if the valve is obstructed, these values will go up. And if during the surgery, if there is some cardiac problem or the anesthetist, he requests you that uh, do not uh, have more pressure, then you can just reduce pressure like this up to 10, 9, 8, like this, okay? Okay? And you can increase it from here as well. So this is about the, and this is a switch on and switch off button, right? This is how to use it. But when you are 
starting it, there are some important things to do. And if you go back of this tower, we can see that there is an insufflator which is attached with the ins uh, cylinder which is attached with the insufflator and you need a knob to open it and close it before and after the procedure. We have power supplies to all our insufflators, camera head and the CCU. Basic and the light source. The basic issue is that we should be aware of these things as well. That's why I'm telling you at the end of the uh, presentation that you should know how to attach these, right? And if if we see that this um, uh, is a system which is attached to the camera head and the other knob VGA is attached to the uh, LED, then we have recording systems at the back and the outputs at the back and in the front as well. I will tell you at the back here, there is the S video out, S video in, and on the front side, there is, I will show you that there is a USB port for recording as well. So we should know how to attach these and how to attach these with the uh, power supplies and they should all be attached to a good quality power supply unit at the back of the wall. Come on the front side. If we see a little of this light source, here you can see that it has got a switch on and off button. Here is a button to control the intensity of light, a knob like thing. And there is a port where you can insert the um, uh, light source cable in. This is basically um, LED light source, but on the other hand, there can be xenon light sources as well. So this is a CCU or camera head unit. This uh, has got a switch on and off button. Then this is basically uh, the camera head um, knob, which is attached into this, uh, in this, into this socket. And then we have a USB recording system as well. And we attach any USB over here and we can record our system from, you can show this, from this button. If you keep this button pressed for a while, it will start recording, okay? You can see record video here. You can show them, right? Can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, so you can have a recording button here and when you want to, take a picture, just click it once and it will be stopped, right? Okay. Now at the end, we will, you know, stop it like this and we will gently detach all the things so they can be secured. So this is about the lab stack. Now I would like all of you to ask any question regarding the graspers, regarding the ports, regarding the uh, patient positioning or the lab stack. Uh, Dr. Amir Khan, can you hear me? Yeah, Dr. Tansir, excellent presentation really. And uh, also, especially your patient positioning, amazing. This is a new concept in my opinion and good orientation for youngsters and viewers and um, so uh, now because we have uh, more than 30 participants on zoom from tanzania chapter uh, dr mohsen or uh, can you hear me dr mohsen yes i can hear you Brian. Yes. Sir, sir, sir if you have any question welcome sir uh really i don't have any particular patient uh, question but uh i'm sure the the presentation was uh excellent but what i could say uh, on uh, instruments and uh, you know the, the lab tech uh, the in the in the in the positioning of the patient uh those are very very important basic uh uh, presentation instruction and uh, 
I'm sure more, more, most of maybe 90% of our participants from Tanzania, they have not uh, really had a hand-on experience with laparoscopy, but they are very eager to learn. And uh, those basic uh, instructions are very, very important. Uh, that is my say. I don't have any specific question. Yeah. Thank you. Th Tansir, very nicely done. I think this was much better than uh, presentation otherwise, because uh, I think this pre-prepared, pre because this actually you gave it a live uh, uh, view of everything and how the equipment is used. I found it very useful to be honest with this demonstration. Just to add uh, one small comment, you know, when uh, with the insufflator, if insufflator starts making noise, there are a couple of main reason is that the pressure has gone up inside the tummy and that's why it makes noise. And that's usually a sign of either a kink blockage or that the patient is waking up and uh, uh, the pressure building up in the tummy. So just people need to be aware of that, but excellent presentation. Thank you very much. And the other reason is the cylinder is empty. It also makes noise then. Yes. So you are very vigilant uh, looking at the indicator of the cylinder, how many bars are left. This is very important. should have a backup cylinder as well. Sometimes the surgery gets prolonged. And if the, the, if, if the cylinder is not there, extra cylinder, you have to uh, open up the patient. So in small setups, it is very important to have an extra cylinder as well before you start the procedure. So this is this is great point because before going to start laparoscopy, you must confirm this. Yes, you have sufficient gas CO2 because especially in periphery in small centers, there is a no central system and there is a chance of so maybe you will finish a small cylinder and you must have such. And one point again, I comment, I must add when you are going to start. So, because when you will go start, so no, so then your pressure must be low, then progressively you must increase your pressure. So this is very important. Then the post-op pain will be less. So when insufflation is speedy, so then, uh, so there is more traction on diaphragm and patient will suffer more pain, especially shoulder pain. These are some tips and tricks and progressively, uh, so you will learn uh, hopefully. Very, very important point you have highlighted. I remember a couple of incidents which happened in, with me in the initial part of my laparoscopic career. Once I was performing a, a laparoscopic ventral hernia. And when uh, the almost the tacking was started, uh, the encephalator stopped working. So everything was done. And as we all know, the price of the, um, you know, Paratex composite meshes are very expensive and the tackers are expensive. I would have not opened the patient and I would not have, you know, what should I have done? That uh, I have used the things and I have converted it to open. Then um, suddenly it came into my mind and I had no backup at that time, no backup insufflator with me. The cylinder was okay, but the insufflator stopped working. We tried it for 15, 20 minutes, but it was not working. Then I requested one of my colleagues uh, who is also a surgeon and his hospital is not too far away, that sent somebody and uh, sent, uh, gave us the um, uh, insufflator. Uh, and he sent the uh, insufflator, so the message, take home message is that you sh should have good relation with your surgeon colleagues as well. There is not just competition with them. If you have good uh, you know, um, things with them, good um, relations with them, they will help you in time of need. Once another point I want to note, at, at another hospital, and it's a big hospital, I was doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Suddenly, the light source stopped working. We tried our level best, and it didn't work. And uh, I, it, the I, the dissection was done, clips were applied, duct was cut, artery was cut, and I had to uh, remove the gallbladder from the gallbladder fossa. So I thought I should do something not to open the patient up. And, and I... Uh, used my uh, iPhone's light and I put it on the, you know, this light source uh, here on the light source exactly. And it, it started working right in the camera. And we had, I had a video of this as well, and I will upload it sometime. Uh, and I've used it in some conferences as well that we performed the whole surgery 
using like another five seven minutes using that light. So, sir, innovation. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Tansir, a great innovator. I think uh, uh, yes, that you should do all these things, but it is to tell that uh, necessity is the mother of all inventions, right? I, I would have opened the patient very easily, and I would have put the blame on the hospital that the gadgets were not okay. But what is the you know fault of the patient? We should be very concentrated about the patient. And now I have always two encephalators, two monitors, everything two, and telescopes three, four, right? So that if anything goes and in, in every setup which I work, otherwise I don't perform laparoscopy because it is our responsibility to be caring and to be safe for the patient. This is a take-home message: be safe for the patient. I think that was a very important lesson, actually. And uh, in our institution, we always have a spare set available uh, because it doesn't, even if you got two sets, but two operating theaters are functioning at the same, same time, you can't help each other. So best thing is to have a spare set in the hospital where you can easily use it. Because I think, at the, as you said, Tanseed, our responsibility is to the patient. And uh, instead of blaming each other, I think we need to take all these precautions beforehand and safety is important for that. Safety. And that's why in most of the Western world now, the WHO checklist is introduced, which is okay. that you check all the equipment before you start the procedure so that there is no way you could have uh, trouble with it. So I think, thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Tansir. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you.